It's my privilege to welcome Pastor Henny Swart from Schofer Johannesburg. So we have quite a history together. We were roomies at the University of Stellenbosch in our third year. Uh, we both studied engineering, and uh, it's just great to, to, to have Henny with us. I did an interview with him yesterday, especially about growing in the teacher gift, and we dove deep into the Word of God. It was uh, uh, invigorating and uh, stimulating, and Henny just really has, he has beautiful, wonderful revelation from the Scriptures, and I believe he's going to break open the Word for us this morning. Amen. So let's put our hands together and welcome Henny Swart. Amen. Thanks, Andre. Thank Thanks very much. Yeah, I was... Um, uh, pr praying earlier um, last week and, and beginning of this week about exactly what God wanted me to share. And he, and he strongly laid on my heart to, to share. Actually, I'm going to share two different messages in the two services. But about, um, about the true gospel and uh, from Galatians. I'm, I'm going to share this uh, in the service from Galatians 1 verse 1 to 8 about the distortion or uh, distorting the true gospel. And then in the second service about experiencing the true gospel. And... Um, yeah, so what, it, it's interesting, uh, Andre, uh, he prayed it at intercession as well, he mentioned it now, but what the Holy Spirit said to me is, you know, take, just take the bread of the Word and just break it open. And, and, and when, when my people smell that fresh bread, they'll, they'll salivate and they'll eat it. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> I just want to, first, before I, I start sharing, just give you a, a few warnings. Warning number one. I'm not Andre. I'm a, like a very sort of quiet, introverted teacher type. I'm not as dynamic a communicator as Andre. Andre was always the guy at university who was running for the SRC, uh, you know, chairperson and all that kind of stuff. He was a dynamic leader and communicator. I was like the, the quiet, you know, uh, introvert guy was sort of just there, you know. So um, don't expect me to, to be exactly like Andre. I'm not as dynamic and so on. But I'm, I'm sure you guys know how to receive someone for who they are. And, and I hope it's a blessing to you. Um, and then second thing is, um, when I share, I often share with the, the MTP guys, our ministry training program guys, and I, share, I teach them how to preach and so on. And, and one of the things I say to them is whenever you preach, you're not just giving people a message, you're also giving them a method. Implicit in the message that you share is the method by which you arrived at that message. And what I want to warn you is that I, I, want to, I, I, I seriously want to give you a method. I don't just want to give you what Scripture says. I want to inspire you and hopefully also to some extent equip you to discover for yourself what Scripture says. Um, and, and, and to me, that's the most powerful thing. I always ask uh, Christians, who of you are going to read the Bible for the rest of your life? Put up your hand if you're going to read the Bible for the rest of your life. Okay? Some of you are. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but think about this. Something that you're going to do for the rest of your life, you might as well learn to do it well, right? And, 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 and the, the quality of your life as a Christian depends on the quality of how... how how, how well you live as a Christian depends on how well you read the Bible. The better you read the Bible, the better you're going to be able to live the Bible and apply the Bible. So it's a good investment to make as a Christian to learn to read the Bible better. And, and the reality is we all need to learn that. I asked Andre if he has a tennis racket for me to borrow. I used to play tennis at school. I haven't played tennis properly for, for, for decades. But um, I remember <clears throat> I used to play almost every day of the week, and then on Saturdays, I'd, uh, you know, go for a four-hour in the morning exercise, you know, you know, in, in Bloemfontein where I was raised, and in the afternoon I played at, at a club for a couple of hours, and, and obviously at the club there were older people, and at probably every club in, in, in the world, I'm sure, every tennis club, there's some other lady who plays an upside-down backhand. Now, have you ever seen an upside-down backhand? Okay. Now, when you play tennis, your forehand, you, you, there's a certain grip that you, you hold the racket like this, and then you, you, you play your, your forehand like, like that, your topspin forehand. Now, <clears throat> if you don't change the grip, obviously your, your wrist is weak. You, know, you, you, can't, you can't hit a backhand like this because, you know, you, you're, a single backhand like this because your wrist is weak. You have to actually change the grip to the other side so that you can hit the proper backhand. Now, there are, there are many old ladies who play at tennis clubs, and 
they, they learned the forehand, but no one taught them that they need to change the grip for the backhand. And now you can't play like this. So what they do is they turn the racket upside down and they, and they hit the backhand like that. That's an upside down backhand. And some of these old ladies have playing that, been playing that upside down backhand for decades. And they play an upside down backhand pretty much as good as you can play an upside down backhand. But guess what? If your technique is wrong, you're never going to be Roger Federer and play a really good backhand. Now, some of us, in terms of reading the Bible, no one taught us the right technique. And, and, and in terms of Bible reading, we're playing an upside down backhand. Okay? And I just want to encourage you, learn, make that investment and learn how to read the Bible well. It's, it's a, so, so my warning is I'm not just giving you a message uh, this morning, I'm giving you a method as well. Please, please get the method as much as you get the message. And then uh, uh, just a third warning. Paul, he has this habit of not always saying what we like to hear and what we want him to say. So if Paul offends you, I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize beforehand for Paul. He's like that sometimes. <laughs> he might say a few things to you that you don't like, but um, what he say, he's speaking, he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So let's, let's listen to what, he, to what he says. I'm just going to read for us from uh, Galatians chapter 1, from, from verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. You can see Paul, um, I mean, the, the letter of Galatians is all about the gospel. What is the true gospel? Okay? And, and, and he's so excited about the gospel that, that, you know, even in his first verse, in the greeting, he starts bringing the gospel in. You know, uh, you know he says, but, but from Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So he's already starting to bring the gospel in there. He's just so excited about it. He can't help himself, you know. And all the brothers who are with me to the churches, notice plural, churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself. So you can see in his greeting already, he's summarizing the gospel. Uh, Grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of uh, of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the, uh, in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. So, He's talking about people who are coming in and distorting the gospel of Christ. Now, remember I said he writes this, not, I think this is the only letter of of Paul's letters that that he actually writes to multiple churches. All his other letters are written to single churches, to the church in Rome, to the church in Colossae, to the church in in Philippi or wherever the place might be, to, to individual congregations. But this one he writes to the churches in the Roman province of Galatia. <clears throat> so, these are churches that he planted, many of them at least, uh, or they were planted by people that he raised up as leaders. And, and, and we might think, but this whole thing about distorting the gospel is, is not such a big issue. It's such a big issue that Paul has to write to all the churches in this province that he, you know, that he planted. It, it's a more widespread and general problem than we realize, this problem of distorting the gospel. Now, <clears throat> Think about it this way. Um, Anything that has value, anything that's really valuable gets counterfeited. Okay? So money, for instance, that has value. And that's why people counterfeit it. They they make, you know, counterfeit notes so that they can make use of the value. And and, and the gospel is is one of the things that has the most value. It's extremely valuable. Now, how do you recognize a counterfeit note, a counterfeit bank note? Exactly. You don't learn to recognize the counterfeit by studying counterfeits. You learn to recognize the counterfeit by studying the true one and knowing the true note so well that when the counterfeit shows up, 
you can recognize this is not the genuine article. This is a fake. This is a counterfeit. And that's why they put you know, all kinds of watermarks and all kinds of distinguishing marks on true money. And the idea is that you, that you be able to recognize them and that they be difficult to copy. Now, it's the same with, with the gospel. The true gospel, the way to recognize the counterfeit is to study and know the true gospel so well that when we see the counterfeit, we can already, already, uh, automatically or, or immediately recognize that this is not the real article. This is a fake. Do you know the true gospel well enough to recognize a fake? Because the reality is, for most Christians, and this is how it was for me as well, the word gospel is a very nice, well-recognized Christian word, but to most of us, it's pretty fuzzy and unclear. If you ask a, a, a room full of Christians, what is the gospel? You know, you'll get a few people scratching their heads and you'll get a whole lot of different answers. It's like the kingdom. If you ask Christians, what's the kingdom? Yeah, the kingdom's important. And, the, and, 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 you know, everyone knows about the kingdom. But if you ask, okay, what is the kingdom? You'll get a whole lot of different answers. It's, it's such, it, 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 they, they are su such important concepts and so widely spread across the New Testament that sometimes it's difficult for us to put together what is it exactly? Okay, so I want you to do something quickly for me. I want you to turn to your neighbor, and I want you to, in a minute to a minute and a half each, just summarize to your neighbor as if they are someone who's never heard about Christianity before. Just in a minute or a minute and a half, summarize to them what is the gospel. If you had to do that, I'm going to give you three minutes, a minute and a half each. Go. So, um, in this passage that we read, I mean, Paul, we, we're talking about the distortion of the true gospel, um, the distortion of the true gospel, and, and uh, you know, Paul mentions a whole lot of things, but, you know, some of the things he, he talks about are, number one, the importance of the true gospel, number two, the content of the true gospel, and number three, the, the, the distortion of the true gospel. So, so often when we read the Bible, we live in a society that's very fast-paced, so we, we, we want instant food, we want instant cash, we want instant relationship, we want instant everything, you know, instant gratification. So, so when we read stuff, we've got so much to read, we, we, we usually just scan, and we read very fast. So often when we, when, 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 we do, when, when we read the Bible, we do the same. We read it so fast, so you could, I read those eight verses, and you can say, oh, mm, that's profound, you know, but actually it's like, in one ear, out the other ear. It's so familiar, actually, that you miss it, that it doesn't stick. And, and sometimes when we read the Bible, we just have to slow ourselves down. So I want to encourage you, just a little tip that I want to give you is, when you do the Bible study, don't just read, especially if you're taking a portion like this and studying it, don't just read it once. And don't just read it in your head. Read it out loud and read it multiple times so they can really sink in. Because when you read it out loud, it forces you to slow down a bit and really just allow what Paul or whoever the Bible author is to see what he's saying and writing to sink in. So let's just um, look at this a bit. I don't know if you've noticed how this passage shows us how important the gospel is to Paul. I mean, I already mentioned the fact that in his greeting already he starts, you know, bringing in the gospel. He's just so excited about it. It's just so important to him. But... The other thing is, <clears throat> in, when Paul writes letters, you can go and check his letters. He, he wrote a whole, quite a few letters in the New Testament. And they have sort of a pattern to them. And to some extent, Galatians follows that pattern. So it's, it's like there's the, the greeting, you know, who the letter is from, the salutation, Paul and, you know, the brothers with me or Timothy or whoever. Uh, to the churches of Galatia, grace and peace to you, and so on. And all of that is, is pretty standard. But you'll see that what's different here in Galatians is Paul starts bringing in the gospel already in his greeting, in his salutation. He starts bringing in the gospel, as he does here. That is a bit unusual, and that shows you that this is very urgent to him. That's very important to him. But not only that, after the salutation, you know, the grace and peace and all of that, what does Paul usually do? You guys know this. You've read Paul. What does he usually do? He either prays for the church or he speaks a blessing over them or he gives a thanksgiving for them. You know, I thank my God and Father, you know, whenever I think about you and whenever I pray about you and I'm so excited about you and so on. Nothing like that here. Nothing. No thanksgiving, 
no prayer, no blessing. What does he say? I'm astonished <laughs> that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Paul dispenses of the niceties. You can see that Paul's actually quite hot under the collar. He's upset. He's, what he's saying here is so urgent that he's not even going to be nice about it. He's not going to even bless them or pray for them or, or give thanks for them. He's just going to rebuke them and say, listen, you guys, <laughs> this, this is serious. So can you see how, how important the gospel is to, to Paul? When, when people start messing with the gospel, Paul gets upset. And that's an indication to you that for Paul, the gospel is seriously important. You can mess with other stuff. You can make you know, other mistakes, but don't mess with the gospel. And, and, and it's understandable because the gospel is the center. It's the, the, the beating heart of, of, of what Christianity and the Bible is about, is, is, is the gospel. And he says, <clears throat> this gospel comes... He says, you know, people are coming and trying to trouble you and just trying to distort the gospel. And, and when they distort the gospel, it goes from, it, it, it becomes a different gospel, which is actually no gospel at all. So, so, so to get the gospel right is important to Paul. He's saying, think about this. How much can you afford to change the gospel before it ceases to be the gospel? You know, and, and Paul is saying, People are messing with the gospel here and, and changing the gospel. It's actually becoming a different gospel, which is no gospel at all, which is not a true gospel, not the true gospel. And the reality is all across the world, all across the world, this is happening. The gospel is good news. What is the good news that you believe? What, what is the good news that you hope in? Andrew is talking about hope. What is the good news that you hope in? Everyone hopes in something. And whatever you hope in, that is your good news. That is your gospel. If your hope is that everything will always go honky-dory with you and your family, with you and yours. That is your gospel. If your hope is that you'll one day have enough money that you won't have to worry again, and even Christians do that. Lord, please bless me with so much money. I'm trusting you to bless me with so much money that I never have to trust you for anything again. <clears throat> That's your gospel. That's your hope. That's what you're hoping. That's what you hope for. That's your good news, Okay. The, 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 there, there, there are gospels of healthy living. There are gospels of prosperity. There are gospels of, I mean, you name it. Every political party, in a sense, is preaching a different gospel, trying to give hope in something. Okay? So this, I just want you to see that this is applicable to us and to our world. There are different gospels, and they are not the same as the gospel Paul is talking about. And Paul says... <clears throat> the authority of this gospel, <clears throat> the authority of this gospel doesn't even lie in him as an apostle or in angels. He says, even if an angel, or even if we as apostles, or an angel from heaven should come and preach a different gospel to you, different from the one we did preach to you, let them be accursed. Wow. <laughs> These people who are troubling you by trying to give you a different gospel, let them be accursed. That strong language. I mean, Paul doesn't say this lightly. And all of this shows us how important the gospel is to Paul. I mean, if the gospel is so important to Paul that he starts speaking anathemas, you know, curses over people who mess with the gospel, then you know the gospel is important. Okay? And, and, and the authority of the gospel, he says, it doesn't lie in me as an apostle. If I change my mind and come and preach a different gospel at you, let me be accursed. If an angel from heaven comes and preaches a different... So it's not about... The, the authority doesn't lie in leadership. Me as a, a, an apostle, someone in a leadership position. That's not where the authority lies. If I pervert the gospel, let me be accursed. It doesn't lie in spiritual experiences. If an angel comes to you from heaven and preaches a different gospel to you, let that angel be accursed. It doesn't lie in, in leadership or spiritual experiences. Why, where does it lie? Let no one preach a different gospel than the one we already preached to. Where is the one that he already preached to them recorded? In Scripture. So the authority for what is the true gospel is Scripture. Sorry, I'm being a bit serious here, but I do want you to see how important the gospel is to Paul. And <clears throat> I want to ask us, is the gospel as important to us as it is to Paul? And is preserving 
the purity of the gospel as important to us as it was to Paul. It should be, right? It should be, I think. Okay, so the importance of the true gospel. Uh, and then he, he, he talks a bit about the content of the true gospel. Let me, just, um, let me just go into that a little bit. I forgot my water over there. Um, thanks. Can you just open it for me, please? Perfect. And, and yeah, I'm just going to go through a bit of this text with you. And just maybe to some extent show you what it looks like to slow down and to, to read this and, 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 and get what Paul is saying. And, and, I, and I want you to see, you'll probably see that, wow, you know, there's a lot more. When I slow down and really look at it and think about it and, and meditate on it, because that's what we're going to do now. We're going to corporately meditate on the scripture. There's a lot more there than I initially saw. Okay, so <clears throat> Paul says, this is, um, he says, Paul, an apostle, he says, not from men nor from man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. So, um, just by the way, we were, Andre and I uh, we were talking about, um, you know, the fivefold ministry, especially the teacher gift. Uh, and and in, in the interview that Andre did with uh, Dr. Corne Baker, Corne said, we must remember that these fivefold ministry gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, are gifts from Jesus. It's not something you earn. It's not something you develop. It's not something you deserve. It's not something people appoint you to. It's something Jesus appointed you. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through men, but from Jesus Christ and God the Father, who, who raised him from the dead. And like I say, he's already bringing the gospel in there. Um, and then he says in verse 3, grace and peace to you from, God the, uh, from our God and Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and this is his usual blessing. And it's, it's, it, all of that is pregnant with gospel. That's, that's all gospel language. We don't always recognize it. But what he's saying is grace. What is grace? Grace is what causes you to be saved, what enables you to be saved. So the grace that causes your salvation comes from the gospel. And the peace that results from your salvation comes from the gospel. And obviously the word peace, shalom, the, the Hebrew word shalom, and translated here in Greek, irene, it's a, it's a very... Deep word, it, you, you, peace is actually an under-translation of it. It's not just peace. It's peace and prosperity. It's all-round wellness and, 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 and well-being. And, 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 and that's the, f in other words, peace summarizes the full results and benefits of the gospel. And it says the grace that causes our salvation and the peace that results from our salvation all comes through the gospel. And in fact, it's so important to Paul that that is his usual greeting in all of his letters. Okay? And then he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the gospel changes your relationship with God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Where God becomes our Father and Jesus becomes our Lord. Now, just think about that for a moment. That's, that's such common well-known, every day, I know this. I've got that language that we can miss it. I remember when, when I lived in Franschhoek, beautiful place. I used to drive through from, from Stellenbosch to Franschhoek. And it's, you have mountains on both sides and then vineyards, you know, on both sides of the road. It's such a beautiful road. And I remember um, in, in, the, in the first couple of months, I used to drive every day from, from Stellenbosch to Franschhoek and then back again, you know, when I, when I started pastoring the church there. And I was just driving there and just so amazed at the beauty of the mountains and the vineyards and everything. After a couple of months, I never, never even noticed them anymore. I just drove there. I've become so used to it, so blasé about it. I drove through that beauty and I didn't notice it anymore. Now we become like that with the truth of the gospel. We become so used to it, so blasé about it that we don't notice it anymore. What Paul is saying here is beautiful. When he says God becomes our father, what, what, what is a father? It's someone who causes you to be conceived and born, who gives you your very identity. I mean, fathers in those days was, were number one. <clears throat> it was your father who circumcised you on the eighth day and gave you a name. And that was your father gave your corporate identity as part of Israel, God's people, and a personal individual identity, your name. Your father imparted your identity to you. Now, as modern people, we know that your father is the, you know, women have two X chromosomes. So you get an X chromosome from your mother. 
but you get either X or a Y chromosome that makes you either a girl or a boy from your father. So even your sexual identity is genetically given to you, imparted to you by your father. Your father is the one who determines your identity in the most profound way and imparts, and, 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 and fathers are the ones who should um, reinforce and strengthen that identity of a child. And that is what God does for us. In other words, the, the gospel enables you to have a new relationship with God where He's your Father, where He determines your identity, where He tells you who you really are, not the world, where you no longer look into the mirror, the social mirror of society to try and figure out who you are and feel good about yourself, but where you look into the mirror of God's Word and God's face and see, this is who I am. This is who God says I am. It doesn't matter what other people say I am. That's the gospel. Your relationship with God the Father changes. Where is your Father who gives you an identity, a family, a place of belonging? But not only that, Jesus becomes your Lord. He said, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, who knows that to start off with, Jesus is not your Lord. Every person born on planet Earth has a different Lord. It's not Jesus. Everyone is born in sin. Usually we are our own Lord and some, usually we submit to some other idolatrous overlord over us. Something else is ruling our lives. We're following someone else. We're obeying someone else. We're becoming like someone or something else. Not Jesus. So in other words, the gospel enables us to change our relationship with Jesus, but also with ourselves. I no longer relate to myself as Lord. I no longer relate to some other idol overlord as Lord. I now relate to Jesus as Lord. In other words, the gospel enables you to come under new management. Right? That's important to say. There was this debate in theology, you know, um, the, uh, can Jesus be your savior without being your Lord? And it, according to Paul and according to the Bible, it's a ridiculous Debate, because Jesus saves you by becoming your Lord. It's by, it's as you follow him as your Lord and obey him as your Lord that he leads you out of the mess you got yourself into, out of the sin, out of the darkness, out of the deceit that you got yourself into. It's by becoming your Lord that he saves you. I was the one, by being my own Lord, I led myself into that mess. By getting a new Lord. I couldn't lead myself out. I could only lead myself deeper in. I, I needed a new Lord to lead me out of what I'd led myself into. So, so the gospel changes your relationship with Jesus and yourself. No longer are you your own Lord, but Jesus becomes your Lord and He leads you out of the trouble you led yourself into. And He says, the Lord Jesus Christ who, oh, just by the way, Jesus, the word Jesus means Yahweh, Savior. And, and the word Christ, it's not Jesus' surname. His, his parents weren't Mary and Joseph Christ. It's his title. Christ means anointed king. But he's not just the anointed king, he's, he's the anointed anointer. So the Holy Spirit is implied there. He's the one who is anointed with the Holy Spirit and who anoints others with the Holy Spirit. That's essential to the gospel. That's central to the gospel. We'll see that in the next service. So those of you who want to stay... You know, <laughs> and hear the rest of the story. Um, but he's the one, he's, he's not just the anointed king who is Lord, but he's the, he's the anointed anointer who anoints us with his Holy Spirit so that we are empowered with what he was empowered with so that we can become more like him. Um, and it says, who gave himself. Now we can, we can say, <laughs> God is the master of the understatement. I mean, Jesus fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. Not just 40 days, not just like the Muslims who fast in the day and then, you know, pig out in the, during the night. He fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. Afterwards, what does he say? What does the Bible say? And he was hungry. That's an understatement if I've ever heard one. <laughs> you know, God is a, Now, it says here, Lord Jesus Christ who? Gave himself. That's such an understatement. That's so... I mean, when you think about it, when you think about it, Jesus had to come down from heaven, all the way from heaven, from perfection, 
from glory to come into our broken world, our sinful world, our disgusting world where there's death and suffering, disease, destruction, deceit, all kinds of bad stuff. He came and he was born into this world. He lived the perfect life on our behalf. He died an innocent death in our place, what we deserved. I mean, he gave himself. It's, it's such a mild way of putting it. But I mean, he says, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, uh, grace and peace from God the Father, or, or I was appointed as apostle by God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, whom God raised from the dead. That means that Jesus died. When it says he gave himself, it means he died. He gave his life for us. Now, has anyone else ever gave, given their life for you? Jumped in front of a car for you? Taken a bullet for you? Your mom probably gave birth to you at the, you know, at, 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 sort of at the, at the threat to her life. But Jesus gave salvation to you at the cost of his life. He loved you. Think about this. How much must someone love someone else to give their life for them? Jesus gave himself. His, his life that he lived and his death that he died. He gave himself for you. How much must he love you to do that? How invested must he be in you to do that? I mean, we don't think about this, but that is the implication of the gospel. How am I doing for time? Ooh, okay. I must go a bit quicker. Um, <laughs> he gave himself, and he says, for our sins. Um, literally, uh, I mean, we, we don't have the, the preposition to translate it properly. The, the, the preposition translated for, in for our sins, is, is the Greek preposition hooper, which, which there literally means on behalf of. He gave himself on behalf of our sins. Now, think about this. Jesus never, never had any sin, never carried any sin except yours. And you've never had any righteousness except his. In other words, this, this talks where he says he gave himself for on, on behalf of our sins. It means that he substituted himself. He put himself in our place. Uh, John Stott has a beautiful way of saying this. He says, the essence of sin is man taking the place of God. And the essence of salvation is God taking the place of man. He took our place. He took our sins. The only one, the only one who never deserved any punishment for sin took all of our punishment for all of our sins. That is how much he loved us. That's what the gospel tells us. But we just skim over it. We just read it and like, oh, that's a nice thought. We don't allow it to touch our hearts, to impact our hearts. We don't meditate it into our hearts. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. Um, he gave himself for our sins but not only that, but to deliver us from the present evil age. In other words, not just dealing with our individual sins, but also with our corporate sins, the societal problem of it. We live in a present evil age. He saved us from that as well. He doesn't just save us from our sins, the penalty of our sins. But he saves us from this present evil age. The salvation that he gives according to the gospel is much bigger and wider than we realize. You know... <laughs> You can break salvation up into three parts. Justification, where God saves us from the penalty of our sin. Sanctification, where God saves us from the power of our sin. And then glorification, where God saves us from the presence of our sin. Right? Now, when we think about the gospel, we think justification. Jesus saves me from the penalty of my sin. And then we stop there. Paul doesn't stop there. Paul says he saves us from this present evil age. Everything He rescues us from everything. The gospel, God saves us from, the, power of our, from the, pres, uh, the penalty of our sin, the power of our sin, and ultimately from the presence of our sin through the gospel. In other words, if, if we think that the gospel is just a, a ticket to heaven, something that you need at the beginning of your Christian life to get you into the kingdom and to get you into heaven, then we don't believe the same gospel that Paul believed. The gospel that Paul believed and that Paul preached was much bigger. That gospel accomplished justification, yes, but also sanctification and glorification in our lives. It did everything. How big is the gospel? Is, is, is the gospel that you believe in as big as the gospel Paul preached? And I think for most of us, we'll have to say, no. I, I, I remember... This is something I basically discovered because I, I thought, you know, the gospel is the ABC of the Christian faith. It's the milk. Not the meat. And, one, and I thought that, yes, 
you're justified through the gospel. That's how you get in. But then you're sanctified by just pulling up your socks and believing Christian principles and, and, and so on. And, and th that's not true. The gospel is not just the ABC. It's the A to Z. The gospel is not just the milk. It's the meat. The gospel doesn't just justify. It also sanctifies you. The way that you become mature as a Christian is through the gospel. If you try and become mature as a Christian apart from the gospel, you're going to become a religious Pharisee, a religious older brother. You're not going to become like Christ. Only the gospel can make you more and more like Christ. Only belief in that. You grow in maturity in Christ-likeness as you more deeply discover and believe the gospel that got you in in the first place. In, we, we're going in our, in our church through the, Paul's letter to the Colossians, and he says, as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, so continue to walk in him. In other words, the way in, as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, the gospel, is the way on. The way in, turn to your neighbor and tell them, the way in is the way on. And he says it's according to God's will. Um, here's the thing. We, we sang that song, Gratitude. When you understand that the gospel was not according to your will, you're saved not because you chose Jesus, but you're saved because God chose you. <laughs> you have nothing to boast in. And you have everything to be thankful for. <laughs> and, and then... The one who, who, who makes the decisive choice gets the glory. And that's why he says, according to the will of God, to whom be glory forever. If you think that you made the decisive choice that got you saved, then you will get the glory. You'll, you'll inevitably take some of the glory for it. But if you believe that God made, it's according to God's will and God made the decisive choice, and you have nothing to boast in, then you'll give all the glory to him. Okay. So, the importance of the gospel, the content of the gospel. And now let's, let's just look at the, the distortion of the gospel very quickly. Um, I hope I can get through this. It says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ, now turning to a different gospel. Notice that he says, when you desert the true gospel, you desert also him who called you through the gospel. In other words, relationship with God through Jesus Christ is impossible apart from the gospel. And turning away from the gospel means turning away from God. So, so that's why this is so important to Paul and why he's so serious about this. Um, <clears throat> and then he says, you're turning to a different gospel. Now, he says, you're turning away from him who called you in the grace of Christ. Now, I wish I had more time to go into that. When Paul talks about the call of the gospel, he's not talking about hearing the gospel preached. He's not talking about um, the call to conversion. He's talking about a converting call. Whom he foreknew, he predestined. Whom he predestined, he called. And, and if I can put it in, in more explicit words, all whom he predestined, he called. And all whom he called, he justified. And all whom he called, he, or all who he justified, he Glorified. That's from Romans 8. So in other words, this call is not a call that goes out in general and then some respond to it. What Paul means with the call is not a call to conversion, but a converting call. The converting call that goes out by the grace of Christ and draws you to God. Does, does that make sense? I, I know that breaks your head a bit. That's what Paul means. Not what we mean sometimes by call, but what Paul means if you read his his letters and stuff, when he talks about the call of God. He, that's what he means. Now he says, it's by the grace of Christ that you're called. You know, what is grace? Grace, per definition, is something you cannot deserve. Uh, Dallas Willard said, grace is, not a, gra grace is not opposed to effort, but it is opposed to earning. Whatever is done by grace, you cannot earn. You cannot deserve. Now, here's the thing. These guys were troubling them and distorting the gospel. What were they doing? They were, you, can, you can distort the gospel in two ways. You can either dilute it by taking away from it, or you can pollute it by adding to it. What were these Judaizers? Because they were, in context, they were Jewish Christians, were coming and saying to Paul, saying to the Galatians, listen, this, this, 
watered down gospel that Paul was preaching, that's not the, that's not the whole gospel. That's not the full gospel. There's something he's missing. This, this belief in Jesus is all good and well, but you need to add something to it. You know what that something is that you need to add? Good works, law keeping, amongst others being circumcised. <clears throat> and I mean, in, in those days, think about it. Abraham was circumcised. Moses was circumcised. David was circumcised. Ezra and Nehemiah were circumcised. Jesus himself was circumcised. All the apostles were circumcised. Doesn't it make sense that you need to keep the law and do good works and be circumcised? But here's the thing. Paul says, and, and, the, and the words that he uses here is, is, is actually amazing. He says, when you add to the gospel, even something that is not bad, even something that is explicitly good, like good works, and, and remember, good works are an inevitable consequence of the gospel. But when you take the consequences of the gospel and you put and you make them part of the gospel, you turn it into a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. Can you see how easy it is to make that mistake? I mean, they weren't, these Judaizers, these false teachers, weren't, they weren't promoting sin. They weren't t telling the, the Galatians to sin. They were telling them to keep the law. But they, the problem was they took good works, which are an ever, inevitable consequence of the gospel, and they made them part of the gospel. And then they polluted, they distorted, they changed the gospel so, there was no, so it was a different gospel. And the word they use is you get two words in Greek for different. Heteros and alos. Heteros means another one of a different kind. So heterosexual, male and female. Another one, male or female, is another sex, but one of a different kind. Okay, so heteros, another one of a different kind. Alos means another one of the same kind. So he says, he says here, um, you are turning to a different gospel, a heteron euangelion, not, which, uh, uh, not a alos, an alos one, not another one of the same kind. The word alos is, for instance, used when Jesus says, I'll send you another paraclete. He says, I send, I'll send you an alas parakletos. I'll send you another. Uh, parakletos means uh, uh, one who walks beside you to help you. He says, I'm your paraclete now. I'm your parakletos. I'm walking alongside you to help you now. But I'm going away. No, Lord, please not. We need you. <laughs> I'm going to send you uh, alas parakletos, another one who is exactly like me. Okay, so he's saying, when you, turn, when you change the gospel, the true gospel, you change it into a heteron euangelion, a different gospel of a different kind, not an alas one, not a different one of the same kind. It's, there's only one gospel, and you cannot afford to change it, not even by adding good works to it. And for us as Pentecostal charismatics, we love miracles, not even by adding miracles to it, not even by adding the gifts of the Spirit. Those are consequences of the gospel. They're not the gospel. When you make the conscious of the gospel, the, the part of the gospel, you change it and it's no longer, it's a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. Here's the thing. Let me just put it in this way. The, the, the false teacher said, I obey, therefore I'm accepted. Paul said, no, it's the other way around. I'm accepted, therefore I obey. When you take the obedience and you make it a prerequisite of being accepted, you change the gospel. Now, now, obeying is necessary. It's good. Paul is all for obedience and good works. But he says, when you make that a prerequisite for the gospel, you deny the grace of Christ, which you cannot earn, and you turn the gospel into a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. Can you see how subtle it is? I obey, therefore I'm accepted, versus I'm accepted, therefore I obey. The same two elements. The one just puts the cart in front of the horses. So here's, here's my encouragement to you. The gospel is much bigger, much more important, much more powerful than we realize. And we must make sure that, like Paul, we believe the true gospel. And we understand, fully understand the true gospel. Not that we just have a superficial understanding of it. That we all need that. Amen.